Christ came to establish a kingdom. But he was already a king. He, along with the Father and the Holy Spirit, the creator and ruler of all creation, he came forth from the right hand of God the Father to be crowned a king. Not simply the king of all the creation, but to be, count, but to be crowned the king of the Jews and to bring back the kingdom, to reestablish God's rule on earth. But not simply as spirit, but spirit that had taken on flesh. He came forth from the Father's throne to be enthroned and I do not yet speak of the cross, but the very first throne that he had was the very womb of his mother Mary, the blessed one, the blessed Virgin Mary. Undefiled, though yet a sinner, she had not yet been with a man. Christ's conception was certainly immaculate, the only one. There in her womb he was enthroned. His second throne would be the manger. And forth from there, wherever he was, there was the kingdom. For a kingdom is where the king is. Though those that should have been his subjects did not know who he was, they certainly heard the announcement of the magi who came to worship him as king, to worship him as God, and to worship him who would die for their sins and the sins of the whole world. This Jesus would come to Jerusalem, to the city of his father David, to the city of his father Solomon, and there his own people, who should have welcomed him, all of them, and many of them did. But by the end of the week, you know what happened. Rejected and despised by all. But that very event was his coronation. That very event was the moment when God won the victory. When Christ defeated all of the enemies of God and defeated all of the enemies, the true enemies of mankind, sinners in their flesh, defeating their sin. He bore that sin in his holy and perfect flesh and died for it. He defeated the devil to defang him. Finally then, on Easter morning, the final enemy that was defeated was death itself. Though he were swallowed up by death, he sprang forth from it to take away its power forever for those who believe in him. The kingdom came through Jesus. The kingdom came on the cross. The kingdom came on the morning of his resurrection. The kingdom, kingdom continues to come. He walked among those disciples for 40 days, preaching to them about the kingdom of God, teaching them, performing miracles so that they who even then at times had their doubts to show them that he was very much real, not a figment of their, of their imagination or of their grief, but to show forth that he was, in fact, raised from the dead. And at the end of those 40 days, from the Mount of Olives, he ascended back to where he began his journey, to the highest throne, above all, to be seated at the right hand of his Father in heaven. All of this Everything that he did was to establish the kingdom of God, to establish his church, the 
place where his teachings are followed, where his statutes and just decrees are heeded, and where his gospel is preached, and where a new and better life, though lived by imperfect people, is sought to be done by the help of the Spirit of God. And oh, do I tell you, that we do need this help. We need the help of uh, this help in the midst of all our sins. Because our sins are great and they are very many. We are not unlike those Israelites long ago. The Israelites, when God established them and brought them into their kingdom, his kingdom, they sinned. A great deal. So finally they asked for a king because they wanted to be like all of the nations having a king. But he was their king. So he gave them Saul and that didn't work out all that well. He gave them David and it was better. And He was a man after God's own heart though he was himself terribly flawed. Solomon's kingdom had even fuller grandeur. That he was a man full of wisdom, but it would seem that as wise as he was, he was at times as foolish as all of us. And then the kingdom was divided. And the kingdom that is divided falls. And it ultimately did. The people fell into manifest idolatry and sin. And for that, Israel was destroyed. The northern kingdom fell. The Jews taken into exile to Babylon. And Ezekiel tells Israel, the chosen of God, about what he was about to do. That which I have already recapitulated to you about his coming to establish the kingdom and why he did it. I act, he says, for my name, for the sake of my name. Why? Because they have profaned it. They have sinned against his name, against his holiness, against his just, just decrees, against his statutes and his commandments. They have not loved each other. As he has loved them, they have all fallen. But God made many promises and God will be faithful. He has integrity. He is true. He is faithful. Though all of us are unfaithful, God is true and faithful and he will be vindicated. And he was. Ultimately, on the morning of his resurrection, for Christ had acted, fulfilled the will of his Father, and did what none of us could do. He won the battle against sin, death, and the devil. Into this kingdom which he has established, he calls his people, his chosen, the elect, the faithful, and he calls them to be disciples. And in this kingdom, he comes to us by his spirit, the one that he sent, the very helper that we need. When he arrived at the throne of God, from that throne, the spirit proceeded from the father sent by the son to the church to give us help in these gray and latter days, these days so full of sin and death to the point where it feels as if the light will be completely snuffed out by the darkness. But into this light, the light of Christ continues to shine. And this Jesus, your King, brought you into the kingdom of God by his Spirit through the very gift of your baptism. He sprinkled you with water, poured that water over you 
and made you a child of God. The name of God placed upon you. And in that water you were granted faith. Your sins were washed away. You were granted the Spirit. And God, as, as Ezekiel said, placed within you a new heart and a new spirit, taking from you the heart of stone and making you alive. And it is by this very Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who bears witness to Christ and through whom the gospel is preached and Jesus' word is followed, that he causes our sanctification. Yes, Jesus is the one who justifies, but that justifying grace comes to us in baptism, that justifying grace comes to us through the preached word that we hear, that justifying grace comes to us in the supper. But from these, the Holy Spirit sanctifies us and makes us holy. And being his holy people, he causes us to walk in his just decrees and statutes and his commandments. Now many would think, because we Lutherans teach our children the Ten Commandments, that that's what is being talked about here. And certainly it's part of it. But it's beyond that. It is that we would seek to fulfill those commandments truly as his people. That we would love one another. That we would love one another in these gray and latter days. And Peter himself, Peter himself who knew and remembered likely the words of Jesus about what it would be like for them because they needed help. Because what would they do to them? They would seek to kill them all. They would put them out of the synagogues. They would persecute them because they believed in Jesus. And he told them, I, I tell you this so that when these things happen, you will not fall away. And now he's not speaking about what's going to happen in two hours because in the garden they would all abandon him. He's looking beyond that to when they will witness to him and his life, his death, and his resurrection. And the Holy Spirit would keep them in the faith. And it is this very same Holy Spirit who keeps you in the faith in these gray and latter days, as, as, as Peter calls it, the end of all things. And he says that it, 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 that it is at hand. And if it was close for Peter and the early church, it's even closer for us. We need the help of the Spirit of God to fulfill the teachings of Christ as believers in him, as we are called to do. And what does Peter tell us to do? He tells us to be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of our prayers. And what does this mean? That we do not get caught up in passions. That we do not get all carried away by our own anger. That we that we be faithful and trust in him. And then he tells us, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. And that is unconditional love. And from unconditional love, the love that he had for us on the cross and the love that he has always had for his people, all people, that is a kind of love that forgives. It is a merciful and compassionate forgiveness. He tells us to be hospitable, to show hospitality without grumbling, to welcome one another. If anyone has a need, you help. 
He goes on, as each has received a gift. Now, this is not, this does not mean monetary, though it's quite possibly a part of it. As anyone has used, has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace, because we are not all the same. We all have various gifts that he has given to us, and he calls upon us to be good stewards of them. So if you have a gift and you have an ability and you do not use it, it begs the question, are you being a good steward of what God has given you? And some would say, you know, and I'm not all that special, and I don't have anything to offer. Yes, you do. If you don't know what you can do in the kingdom of God, come and ask. There's lots to do. He goes on. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God, meaning those that preach, preach the word. Be faithful. And those who serve, as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. The strength that he supplies is his very spirit that all of you have within you. Spirit of the Father, Spirit of the Son, and in serving one another. And however we do, it is all to be done to the glory of God. And as we serve him in this kingdom, our God of grace, the King of glory, we know that there will be difficulties ahead in the church, and at home, at work, in our world, and in this country. And it might quite possibly might even be the worst kind of calamity that befalls the church to be persecuted for the name of Jesus. But what does Peter tell us to do? To rejoice that we share in the sufferings of Christ and to be glad so that when Christ returns to judge the living and the dead, we shall rejoice and be glad all the more to enjoy the blessings of the kingdom that he has imparted to us in his kingdom. So let us praise him. Let us give thanks to our God who gives us all, all the good gifts of his Father in heaven. To Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.